between the mid uh, uh, 2000s and uh, 2010s, we actually see 10 years of what we would call a golden age for labor activism in China. So that was the 10 years where we actually see fast economic growth. We see a lot of labor struggles. We see rising real wages, actually. And we see also fast capital accumulation. So this actually shows that that 10 years was really marked a period with very successful labor activism. So the labor activism actually has some very positive impact on the real wage growth. But then all of a sudden it changed in 2016, right? We see the, uh, the labor repression and all that. So I was trying to explore why, why is this un inconsistent? So my name is Ying Chen, and I'm an assistant professor of economics at the New School. I am a political economist. My work mainly explores the contradictions of capitalism and how it manifests itself uh, in the form of different kind of crisis, and in various crises in various areas, actually, but uh, including and probably primarily now uh, on the ecological crisis. Um, I also study development, and I see this unequal um, uh, development process uh, between the global north and global south as an innate feature of the overall capitalist development process in the world. Most recently, I've been working on uh, intervening the debate of uh, global climate change uh, uh, from the global south perspective. Most studies on climate change, and particularly China's role in it, uh, usually starts with a positivist description, like what China has done and has not done yet, and uh, what China uh, is doing and is not doing, and then ends with a normative prescrip prescription, like you know uh, what China is supposed to do. So for me, uh, this kind of analysis lacks some uh, understanding, some historical, political, and social understanding of how China uh, make the choice, why China makes some of the choice that it is making today, what has driven China uh, into the position today that in a way shapes its decision-making process. So my intervention was really to, to use an historical and a political analytical perspective to see what has happened before historically and what is China's current economic system and therefore what are some of the constraints that China has at this moment to pursue more progressive policies for the climate change crisis. And therefore also at the same time, I try to look at how can some of the limits that China is experiencing right now can really be lifted uh, given its internal economic condition as well as its external positions in the world. There is one uh, study that I recently worked on that shows, for example, that although uh, China we can find that uh, when it invests, it invests in renewable energy sectors, it can actually generate twice as many jobs as the same level of spending if it were uh, invested in the fossil fuel sector. So that's actually very good news, right, for people who are serious about green economy transitions. The thing is that if you look closely uh, at, at the data, you actually find that more than half of these jobs, particularly in the solar and wind energy sectors, are actually in the informal sector, which means those jobs are going to be uh, low wage and uh, with little uh, social welfare protection. So that's actually not good news for the uh, for the labor. So that is actually a very important uh, thing to look at that I feel is currently missing from the mainstream debate on, uh, say, uh, uh, Green, Green New Deal or even the global Green New Deal, uh, which usually would see uh, the global South country as passive recipients. So the focus, the priority is always on the global North countries uh, about what should be done there. And then talk about, uh, okay, we can facilitate some kind of technological or financial transfer to the global South country, which is already a very progressive proposal if you think about it, right? It's much better than the proposal that completely ignore the global South countries. But if you think about it, the, the global South countries are still treated as passive recipients. So whatever is going on within the bloc, within the global South bloc, was not really carefully studied. Problem that I just mentioned about, say, informality in China, right, is actually a very common problem for a lot of the global South countries as well. So this, uh, so this problem, if it's, it's not addressed, uh, then even with 
a lot of the technological or financial transfer to those countries, we will still see uh, informality, right? We will still see labor exploitation. We will still see uh, job precariousness, right? So all these problems should also be at the center of the debate, I would say, rather than just as an outcome of whatever is initiated uh, in the global so south. I think this part, the, the global south perspective, was really a key thing uh, in, my, uh, in my work. And it has also informed some of my other discussions, um, things like um, the concept, some of the concepts that we often use in the climate change debate, such as climate finance, climate debt. For example, I, uh, in the recent paper, my co-author and I were arguing that you know, concepts like climate finance is very ahistorical and apolitical, and it focused really just on the technical part of it, while climate debt is a much progressive, much more progressive concept because it actually integrates historical dimension of the story. But then it also has its own limits because you know, how can you really calculate, how can you really quantify the debt, right? How do you, can you calculate human lives? So it's, it can get really tricky uh, in the process. So what we would propose is that if we really want to start with a global south perspective, then we need to actually be very serious about the concept of global carbon budget. There are a lot of discussion, actually, a lot of scientists were able to make a very good estimation on the global uh, carbon budget, how much we basically, how much carbon that we still have left uh, to consume if we want to maintain in a, uh, you know, a, a 1.5 Celsius degree scenario, right? So it's actually a very straightforward concept. I mean, if we think about it, I mean, we have right right now mostly commonly measured as 400 like gigatons of CO2, right? Uh, so we have also a projection of the human population. So just straight, very straightforwardly, we can divide it and calculate how much is left for each con each person to consume. My approach to development, again, uh, I would say, uh, focuses a lot on the economic history uh, of, of China, as well as uh, the economic system it is operating under. Um, so, for example, there are a lot of people who would say, okay, China has had economic miracle, right? It has had some economic success. Um, and, but at the same time, you know, people would also say, well, there are a lot of inequality issues, there are uh, ecological destruction, there are labor exploitation. So how can we avoid those problems while having all these economic success, right? So my approach to that was actually, I see China, first of all, um, as uh, especially its market reform. I see the market reform period as really the start of its capitalist development process. So in that sense, all the problems and the success should be expected from this whole process. Starting from the 80s was the beginning of the market reform and into the 1990s would be where uh, the privatization has really peaked. So that was the full-fledged kind of market reform, a capitalist de development process starting from the 90s. But definitely before 80s, we, could, we can categorize it as a planned economy period. Two things that are really important for my development work, one is the economic history and the other is the economic system. So the economic history part uh, for me is important because um, I see China's success the economic miracle, not just starting from the market reform period, it actually is built upon what was achieved in the planned economy as well. There are a lot of economic historians these days starting to talk about this, uh, uh, economic historians such as Robert Allen, who talked about how the planned uh, period was able to leave China a very healthy, educated labor force, which later was very uh, helpful in terms of China's integration into the uh, global division of labor. And because that uh, disciplined, healthy, and educated labor force appear to the global capital, foreign capital, as really cost-effective, right? So without that, you can't really have a very f a kind of uh, comprehensive uh, integration into the global division of labor, later facilitating the economic success in China. So I think that part of the history is actually very important. So we should really be very aware of what happened before the market uh, period. So my research in that sense uh, often actively engage with what happened before the market period. 
And the economic system part, uh, I would just say that instead of seeing uh, China's success as, um, you know, uh, uh, as just a result of the market reform and all these problems just as side effect, I actually see them as inseparable. So along with the capitalist development, the success and the problems actually go hand in hand. So it's 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 impossible for me to, to think of a, a, a possible solution, a possible development path in that sense that uh, only has the economic miracle, right? But does not, but without all these problems of environmental destruction, because that's really the logic of capitalism itself. Um, so uh, in, in that sense, uh, if we really want to confront all of those social issues, it is very much important to acknowledge the overall logic of the economic system and to try to confront it and then go beyond it. So, uh, for example, I have a, a, a work that uh, talks about uh, uh, why did the Chinese government uh, exercise this really brutal repression of uh, labor uh, activists in 2016. So this is actually a big event. It happened in Guangdong province, right? A lot of the activists, especially the student activists, was violently repressed by the government, put into jail and all that. So a lot of the experts analyzed this as just a consistent and expected behavior from authoritarian government. But by looking close into the data, I actually find that between the mid uh, 2000s and uh, 2010s, we actually see 10 years of what we would call a golden age for labor activism in China. So that was the 10 years where we actually see fast economic growth. We see a lot of labor struggles. We see rising real wages, actually, and we see also fast capital accumulation. So this actually shows that that 10 years was really marked the period with very successful labor activism. So the labor activism actually has some very positive impact on the real wage growth. But then all of a sudden it changed in 2016, right? We see the, uh, the labor repression and all that. So I was trying to explore why, why is this an inconsistent, right? So a lot of people would say, okay, it's just because the government changed their mind. So to me, that's a very superficial analysis. Uh, what really happened was that uh, the golden age really comes with rapid capital accumulation. And that was the period when both the local government and the capitalist class uh, really uh, needed the capital accumulation. And so there was a lot of demand for labor. The real wage was uh, also growing. But of course, with the capitalist development, you started to see slow capital accumulation. Right? Once those happened, the overall conditions changed. And so the, the capitalist class can not afford this kind of compromise that they made before, and they, therefore they don't want to abide by it anymore. Right? So what happened was that either they relocate to the inner region, from the coast region to the inner region, because the labor is much cheaper there, or they just rely on the local government to brutally repress labor there. So I think this kind of uh, analysis of the economic reality is really important for us to understand some of the policy choices. So if we understand that, we probably would think it's quite naive to say that, okay, we need to advise the government to regulate the capital and to treat labor more fairly, because it's not that they don't know they can do that, right? But the, the logic that they're in, that they have such a high stake in maintaining this kind of economic environment that is good, that is friendly for capitalists. So they are always ready, basically, the government, the local government is always ready to repress labor whenever they see needed. So when the capital accumulation slows down, right, and, and the profit margin was really, really thin because of China's position in the global economy, they think that's the time to really intervene. So I think in that sense, we can really see the logic of this kind of inconsistent behaviors. The socialist uh, project uh, has worked for some of the uh, poor countries in the 20th centuries to address this question of economic development, really just in the sense of economic development in terms of, you know, producing uh, essential goods and services for the people, providing this kind of basic public services to the people. So this is why when a lot of people are saying, you know, at the beginning of the market reform, China was still very poor by uh, GDP measure, but actually lots of people, when they say that, they didn't 
realize that a lot of the public services in the plant economy, or we can say socialist economy, that's a big debate. A lot of people yeah. don't really think that ever existed in any part of the world. But I would say I actually belong to the school that think there was a socialist attempt there. Um, but the thing is that a lot of the public services at the time were affordable and free and was not marketized. Therefore, their value was not even counted into the GDP. So if you really look at the social indicators uh, during the socialist period in China, you would see that life expectancy-wise and uh, literacy rate-wise, China was able to achieve the level that already exceeds many of the middle-income countries by before 80s, I meant before 80s. So that's also something that I mentioned before, you know, how the, the, the Chinese labor force was so prepared after the economic reform to join the global division of labor, right? So I think that really worked uh, for some of the uh, poor country agrarian economy in the 20th century. It also has posed some threatening uh, factor, threatening effect on the capitalist economy as well. So we see the, a lot of um, struggles, labor struggles in Europe. In Europe, we also see, you know, the New Deal uh, in in the United States, which people are still talking about, right? Going back to the Golden Age and all that. But we should realize it's all under this global kind of political struggle that, in a way, threatens uh, the the kind of more probably more radical version of capitalism. So I think it's all intertwined in that sense.